Good morning, Nubians. Uh, good afternoon on some people this evening. Hi, we're here in class episode 97. Wow. Wow. Okay. We, I, we, love it. I love it when you say it. I know it's it's uh, the drumbeat here. Um, every day I'm in awe at what has been built, but more at the people that have come, brought their bricks, you know, all of the educators we just put up in Nubia, a whole, you know, space for educators, and it's already full and active. And it's, you know, it's like, how does that happen? Oh, because people brought their bricks and they're ready to work. Right. Love it. And that came directly out of what well, I know it was over a thousand. We're talking about like nearly 1,300 people Monday night doing miseducation of the Negro and teachers came in and a couple of teachers made comments and Carl pushed the switch. And next thing you know, we have the teacher's lounge, <laughs> which is like, and now, and so I can't wait to jump in there as a teacher, as teachers, you know, j just that quick. So shout out to that uh, Baker's Dozen Thousand. Yes, yes. <laughs> and for people who are, you know, on YouTube, you don't know what we're talking about. In narrative, there is the uh, community arm called Nubia, where every week we live stream. Hold up. I'm, 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 I'm logging in now. I know you're in Nubia now. So we're live streaming right now in Nubia before we actually go live, uh, before we post this uh, in YouTube. So the Nubian, all right, let me, let me. Uh, no, 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 no. Yeah, I'm going to mute myself. I did it. I did it. So, all right. So. So as Dr. Carr, he's logging into Nubia where we have a live chat going on, which is completely different than a live chat uh, on YouTube because people are different. And so um, the community is amazing. So uh, on Monday nights, Dr. Carr hosts office hours where right now it's the largest book club, I think, in the world. Uh, you, we are breaking down the miseducation of the Negro Carter G. Woodson. Right. <laughs> That's right. And it's not, a, and it's not, we used to, we, in, in, in our Mongeese for Philadelphia Freedom School for many years, uh, we, you know, the, the teenagers would work at the schools with their hundred or so elementary and middle school students all week, except Wednesday, when we would all come together and we would always have the book and we do the work. And so the all day Wednesday, we would be in small groups with their fact with the faculty, our freedom school faculty teachers. And then in the afternoon, we will all come together as a body of the whole. And uh, at its peak, we'd be several hundred, I think close to 400, I think was the largest we ever got. High school students all over the city of Philadelphia with the books. And we would do what we call Medu Majat. Well, I called it Medu Majat. Medu is speech or talk. Uh, Majat means book in ancient Egyptian. So book talk. And so in about 90 minutes, I would hit the main points and then we just have conversation. So what we're doing in Nubia is ostensibly we could call it a book club. And we do because that's a phrase that people are familiar with. Um, and I'm sure folks who have not yet joined us uh, in, the, in, in the narrative space would say, well, how can you have a discussion with 1300 people? The answer is quite easily. With the technology, uh, the, the Karen, as you know, the vision is just your vision is so compelling that it has brought us into this learning space. And with our determination that we made, you know, we're going to jailbreak those things that have been held apart from us as something that is unattainable or attainable at such a great sacrifice that you can't do it. We have the capacity and I uh, expect there going to be more people actually Monday. And so I'm sure a number of people came into the space like, how is this going to work? Well, it worked away. In fact, Carl, before I even went through chapters one through six, and for those of you who are be joining us this week new, everybody in Nubia knows this, but uh, we will be going uh, chapters six through 12 on Monday. Um, before I even did that, first thing, Carl asked a question. So I had to answer the question. So we went right into, and so the chat, which is that annotation function I've been talking about. I told you I was uh, read um, this interesting book, Remy Keller and Antonio Garcia annotation on the concept of annotating. In other words, as we're thinking with uh, text, spoken text, written text, we are writing as well. The chat, I left the chat open all week. I had to because the conversation between folk in the chat and I'm scrolling the chat, replying where I can, folk came in the conversation and we were only we only do two hours. It's a two hour tight two hours, except this first conversation we had was three and a half hours. 
because we're not just talking. I'm not just talking about I'm not talking about the book. We are having conversations that last. And I'll mention this and we'll keep going. That last uh, when we were doing it, split screen conversation and then in the chat conversation back and forth. And we had a conversation around Woodson's discussion and critique of John Jasper's uh, uh, sermon, The Sun Do Move, which is very famous in black the among uh, you know, black theologians talk about that and the and the and the tension between the masses of African people who are becoming Christian, who are looking at this and the whole dispute of whether, you know, the earth goes around the sun and the sun goes around the earth, which isn't a dispute at all, obviously, in terms of science. In terms of spirituality, the idea that Joshua, that God made the sun stop, and John Jasper is most one of the most popular black preachers in America, and there's a tension there that Woodson addresses in the Miseducation of the Negro, and, and and so I won't get too deep into that. But we had a whole conversation around that, and we're annotating the whole time, so it isn't just a, uh, it is a book club that turns into Mandu Majat text talk. We are having conversation with the ancestor, and so even as people who were commenting on Monday night. I've read this book before. I was assigned this book before. It was in my family library. I've read it many times. This time in rereading, and it's always a blessing. A lot of reading is rereading. The conversation was different. So y'all should, uh, you know, get down with the crew if you're so compelled, because this is a, we're not going back to the world as it was. We want to solve education. We know how to teach ourselves. Anyway, so that was, yeah, Monday was, yeah, and I wanted to show my shirt that you had this shirt on. Mm -hmm. I got mine in the mail. I was like, JAC. Oh, this is beautiful. Uh, the gear is beautiful when it's only exclusively for Nubians. And I'm, and I'm, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm repping Tuskegee, which actually John Henry Clark was born not too far from Tuskegee, Union Springs, Russell County. All those places down there are within an hour of each other. My mom born right down there too so we kind of matching up on alabama we matching colors country. we matching we yeah we, we, we definitely do you definitely do we yeah. see each other <laughs> and shout oh, out to the alabama crimson tide absolutely. not or the georgia bulldogs not why because well, ain't none of y'all uh, when i see you young boys stand up behind stacy abrams talking about no more plan till we uh secure all these rights in georgia then i might give y'all a shout out but until then and, and get that bulldog off the field i'm talking about the one who's hit one time too many who's running for the senate down there anyway anyway that's a whole nother conversation <laughs> Herschel walker um, all right i, I want to say one thing about vision you know um vision is not like you can conceive of something but unless you can conceive of something understanding that you need people to help fulfill it like this space that we're in right now could never happen unless people decided they wanted to do it and they like I had no idea if they did want to. I know I wanted to. I know every time I sit with you, I'm like, I want to know more. I don't know if anybody else wants to know more, but I want to know more. I want to know this. I want to know this. Um, we need to talk about this. I'm constantly sending you text. Like, can we talk about this? What you know about this? <laughs> and I which is great. Imagine, I love it. I couldn't imagine I was the only person. So it hurts mm. it, it my heart to see you know right now in Nubia all these hundreds of people who are up to you know eight something in the morning to to come in and get this um, and who thousands on a Monday night, a Monday or night. In to have a conversation. It, it warms my heart, but it also tells me who we are. Like this, this is the way we get to freedom by first opening our mind to the possibility and then start to imagine what it looks like and then start to strategize. And, and I feel like we've been addled in this country, in this world, you know, and, and you know, inculcated into thinking in a way of being that is um, antithetical to who we are naturally. Uh, we are people of the sun of the earth and That's we are right. community. We're community people. That's we're not individuals. We're not, you know, right. get come on now. Come you know, on. Like, oh, oh, well, you know, the rap culture that has been also pounded into us. That's not who we are. No. You know, we are loving people who um, help one another get there. So, um, and, that, and that's not who, who human beings are. I think we have to understand. Uh, let me not, not there. And then I made the mistake then, the failure of, of diseducation or miseducation to say, I think. No, it's clear. We have experienced, we, talk, we were talking about this before we went live. You know, there's only one species, it's human beings. And the cultures of the world vary by our varied experiences as we migrated around the world. And there are powerful lessons in all of our experiences as humanity. And there, there are powerful lessons on what works best and what doesn't work best. Quite frankly, 
when we walked out of Africa, migrated into Western Eurasia and got caught between the ice ages up there, the Verm ice ages. There are some very powerful lessons we learned about survival, adaptation uh, in what we would now call Europe. Some very powerful lessons, some very beautiful lessons and some very powerful ways to maintain our common humanity, that commitment to community that is hardwired into us. Also, some very powerful lessons on what not to do. Greed and selfishness and materialism. Many of the things that Martin King critiques, and we're going to talk about Dr. King in a moment. And it's important for us to always understand that there's only one species. And people say, well, race is not real. No, race is absolutely real. When they say that, of course, they mean it's not bi a biological reality, uh, but it is a social and cultural one. And it comes directly from the varied experiences of our species as we have migrated out of Africa and populated the world. And this is what Dr. Du Bois, W.E.B. Du Bois, uh, very early in his life, 29 years old, uh, in 1897, here in Washington, D.C., gives a talk called The Conservation of Races. And uh, it's very interesting as a, as a scholar who's publishing a lot in the last few years, mostly for University Press, Nahul Chandler, who has been annotating. There's that word again, annotation a great number of Du Bois's key texts. And The Conservation of Races is a very interesting text. It was a talk he gave for the American Negro Academy. And um, right now, as we go through Woodson in Nubia, you know, been thinking about what the next book is going to be. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute as well. And of course, The Souls of Black Folk is already there in narrative. Everybody can access it as we can access the miseducation of the Negro. Shout out, of course, to the great Itabari Zulu, who is uh, an ancestor, the founder and editor, first editor of the Journal of Pan-African Studies, who uh, digitized the copy. And that's the copy we use. But um, I mentioned that because there's a whole chapter on Alexander Crummel, who started the American Negro Academy, a story for another day. That's the, 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 the space that Dr. Du Bois gave the talk, um, the conservation of races. But Neither here nor there. The, the only point I wanted to mention in bringing up Du Bois in that speech today is that Du Bois says in that speech something that he maintained through the rest of his life, which is all members of the human family, all groupings have something to say to the world. And we should not be in such a hurry to attempt to uh, exchange our collective experiences and culture as people of African descent for some sense of access to something we don't even completely understand, namely the American project. This is 1897. No, 18, yeah, 1897. We shouldn't be in such a hurry that we don't stop to reflect on what is it that allows us to, in the words of uh, Milana Karenga, who says this all the time, speak our special truth to the world. And so I just wanted to say that because as you uh, are reflecting on the power of community, that is one of the strengths of the species. We wouldn't be here without cooperation and community. And we ignore, reject, uh, belittle that at our collective peril, as we see, because the earth uh, is poised on the brink of deciding collectively that this species <laughs> got to go. <laughs> but, you know, because we don't seem to, and this is it, we don't see, and this is one of the ways of knowing in terms of our Africana studies framework, which we're going to spend some more time with this for a few minutes today. That ways of knowing category had to did or do Af how did or do African people make sense of in the world and, and the way we understand reality. The spiritual traditions of Africa, the ways of knowing of African people in their great diversity have a common uh, have a common theme, several common themes, many common themes. But one of them that runs through is that we don't anthropomorphize creation. In other words, we don't project the idea of being human beings onto reality. So you're not going to see big hands <laughs> fashioning reality. God created the world and then we draw pictures of big hands. No, there are no hands. God doesn't have a gender. God doesn't, God isn't human. God is God, creator. Now, anything else you want to name, we can we can create gender. Usually, particularly like you see those, those, those un, uninterrupted African spiritual traditions, you're not going to see gendered expressions that aren't, that don't express the full range of gender possibilities. That's why, you know, people now fascinated with this notion of queering everything. We're going to queer this. We're going to queer this announcement. We're going to queer. I just step back and say, hey, knock yourself out. 
the more you understand the ways of knowing of Africana, the more you understand you ain't even got to do that. But, you know, I understand you're starting from now rather than starting from then. So you just start from now. You just keep working your way back. And in a minute, that light bulb going to go on. But if but, you know, neither here nor there. My point is that we don't anthropomorphize. We don't know. We don't create a notion of humanity. We got to understand reality in human terms. And I said that very importantly for this reason. When you start talking about environmentalism, you start talking about the impact of humanity on the planet, uh, pollution, uh, the idea that we're harming the planet. When you look at those Africana ways of knowing, that's not a revelation because we don't see the community doesn't start or stop with relations between human beings. The community begins with the with the notion that everything is connected. Everything in reality is interconnected. So the harm that we create is a harm that echoes everywhere. And so I just wanted to mention that as well, because when you said, you know, we can't do anything by ourselves. We know as African people that we never forgot that. And what Du Bois was saying in the conservation of racism, among other things, is you speak your special truth to the world because the world needs that. So, yeah, we we are collected. The collective possibilities are just. Hmm. And it's, it's always interesting to me, you know, because I've been moving this way my whole life. Right. And it's always funny to me, the skepticism that I encounter or the number of people that can't quite believe. So you want us all to win. Yeah. Yeah. I want everyone to win. So let's go. And the pushback, I've gotten so much push pushback from people that you expect to be like, let's go. They're, they can't, they can't believe it's true because that's how diseased we have become, you know, to forget that this is the way, the only way we win is together. The only way we win is together. So let's, let's figure this out. Um, Monday is a holiday. <laughs> uh, and, and this past week we've seen a Supreme court overturn mandates, uh, by the government. I don't know whether I agree with them or not, but it's interesting. Well, I love it. I love it. They just tearing themselves to pieces just watching this this current supreme court act so politically um that it's disgusting uh voting rights i think is off the table now right but president biden wasn't able to get that out kristen cinema and the 59 that at least according to forbes report in december last december the 59 billionaires who have contributed to her uh, various campaigns since 2016 only one of which lives in arizona shout out kristen you toony loon I love your style. I love your style. <laughs> I love your style. I know that's a little remix of Shanice, but I love your style, Chris. Chris, um, thought you gonna run for president? Did you see that? I, I, I'm like, how did, did she? No, I mean, but hey, you know, I mean, it is what it is. You know, strolling around on the floor of the United States Senate, bending her knees, curtsy with her thumb down, like she listening to the Go Go's. We got the be, we got the be, be. Isn't it nice when you could just when you've reduced the chamber of the uh, federal legislature into basically a little show? But then again, as my brother Francois. Uh, Addison Francois, who's a professor, a law professor at Georgetown, was on the faculty at Howard for a number of years. I loved his brother, New Yorker, Haitian, by way of New York. And uh, Francois is doing a lot of work in, in reconstruction area. He's studying the reconstruction area in the United States. And one of the things he said, he said, you know, I'm not going to get into a political analysis, but my study of reconstruction and the United States Congress and Senate during that period uh, reminds me of one thing. This country has always elected idiots. <laughs> in the United States Senate. So, <laughs> so cosplay, cosplay coal mine and Joe and Tooney Loon uh Kristen, you know, they they not new. They yeah, not but they're, they're gonna uh probably all uh quote Martin Luther King on Monday. Mm -hmm. Oh, and then we got mm -hmm. Maya Angelou on a quarter on the other side is a enslaver. Did you get yet? No, I'm I refuse. Why? Because there's an enslaver on one, like it's it's monkey paws, Doctor Carr. They keep giving us <laughs> monkey paws. You gonna give us a damn Juneteenth holiday? Ain't nobody asked for that, and then you gonna put Maya Angelou on a quarter? Who can I give you something if it's yours? Who asked for that? Who? Ain't nobody. I mean, you know, I ain't mad. I you ain't got mad. Your, you got your quarter? No, nah, not yet. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, but but it's on the way. Really? I don't wait. I, I don't wait to go to. Yeah, I gotta go. And get the quarter, you know. But I keep a few little coins around here. This is my Booker T. Washington joint. If I want, oh, if I want Washington, I get a Booker T. Washington. You know, Booker T. was on the coin. This is the uh, the back they have. Uh, it's called. Um, I think this was a fifty cent piece. When was this issued? 
the Washington coin, yeah, the Washington half dollar uh, dates from 1946. Uh, Y'all can't really see that. You see a little bit. But on the back, they got uh, a a, a log cabin. And it says, from slave cabin to hall of fame. Y'all can't really see. (laughs) I mean, (laughs) but my point is that um, I'm going to get a couple. I I did. I, I got a couple of them, my Angelou. I mean, you know, pay three dollars, get a couple of coins in the mail. I'll stick them. And why? Because you know, I do it for the same reason that I had to go to the museums. I mean, you know, these are crime scenes, and so you know, I'm sure our First Nation kin were celebrating and furious, uh, and maybe the same people when they put Sacagawea on one of them. I mean, you know, my Angelou ain't the first woman they put on. In fact, she. Most of the people, well, I won't say most, let me not, because I'm thinking now of the exhibit that's at the Museum of the American Indian entitled Americans and the companion volume called Officially Indian. If you ever get a chance, get your hands on that. I had closed my eyes because I had to look at the cover to read it, <laughs> but yeah, I could remember sitting there somewhere. Officially Indian, which is a compendium that the Smithsonian did. Uh, what's the guy named Paul Chat? Uh, what's his last name? Who's the director of the National Museum of the American Indian uh, Museum? I love going to, by the way. Um, the exhibit and the companion volume kind of give a running list of all the times that indigenous people in what is now the United States of America have been used in iconography. And so as we think about Maya Angelou being stamped on the coin, we, 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 it doesn't take, but in fact, let's, 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 let's take a 30 second exercise here, Professor Hunter. Okay. How many things can you, if you're just sitting there, think about when you walk through this country, grocery store, watch TV, they got Native American names. Yeah. Um, I've seen food products for sure. So many food products, right? Food products, uh, some whole states. No. Yeah, if you can yeah. name all 50 states, you can say at least one word in two dozen, at least two dozen Native American languages. Mm-hmm. Cities. Um, you know, the, the problem I have with the coin, first of all, she's she's on the tail end. So of course. She's on the back. She can't be on the front. Right, because Washington is still on the front. Who owns yeah, I mean, 300? Who, who Harriet Tubman? <laughs> anyway. Yeah, so I'm like, you know, the, what's the compromise? You still got a man that owned 200 plus people on the on the head. He's still the head of the coin, and you put her on the back, and you're gonna put Sally Ride and a Wilma Kill, Kill Man, Man Killer and a whole bunch of other you you know every How about that they're gonna put you know different women on the back, but she's still gonna be the oh, tail. Oh, son, let, let, let's linger in that for just ten seconds. Where else but in the absurd amusement park ride called America <laughs> could you have a coin currency with Man Killer on it? I mean, you just gotta sit with that for a bit. <laughs> Man killer. This country is insane. Yes, right? it is. It's insane. Like none of it makes sense to me. And I'm like, all right, um, what do we do with this? What do we do That's with this? Question. You know what? You just settled it. You just settled it. All right, y'all. Nubians, get ready. We're gonna finish the miseducation of the Negro. And then we'll do a February book. Dr. King, Martin Luther King was assassinated April the 4th, 1968. So for March, so we'll lead into this. We're going to do a close read. Where do we go from here? (laughs) Chaos or community? You just settled it. What do we do with this? Yeah. Where do we go from here? Go ahead. There's a part of me that's uh, optimistic. And again, every day I sit in Nubia, and I, I feel like it, it's possible because it's a global, it's a global, global move. You know, it's not just, oh, we're here in America. We're going to fix America. No, nah, we're not fixing America. I'm going to step, step to the side. Let go ahead. Y'all go ahead with all of this insanity while we build over here, the community that we remember who we are. And that's right. That's right. Then, we, then we strategize country to country, how we come together and pull all these, pull all these resources all of these resources and and then create the world we want to live in that's that's the grand vision there's the step there it is right there you just gave it to us so so what would what would mlk <laughs> well let, let, let's i want to uh mm, 
see, I'm gonna resist the urge. Let me see if I see it. If I if I see one, I'll pick it. Uh, but I don't see my 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 uh compendium, Kerry James Marshall. Okay, this is a this is a book called Black Market. I've showed y'all this before. In uh, Aaron Carrico's book, Black Market: The Slaves' Value in National Culture After 1865. This ain't why I'm showing it to you this morning. Uh, in uh, in Nubia, those of you who are not in the uh, <laughs> Uh, in Nubia, y'all don't know this, but if you're watching on YouTube uh, later, uh, Marva Richards, uh, Marva <laughs> started laughing. She said, LOL, amusement park called America with the K's in America with the, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that reminds me of Ice Cube, right? F you, Ice Cube, that's what the people say. F America, still with the triple K. But uh, yeah, he, she put two K's in her America. But Marva um, laughed when I said amusement park called America. Let me annotate that. When I said amusement park called America, it's because uh, this is just a, a panel of Kerry James Marshall's uh, uh, painting, 1994 acrylic painting, collage on canvas called Great America. He makes it an amusement ride. <laughs> so you see the Africans mm -hmm. in the boat going into the tunnel and you see the white ghosts and you see, wow. <laughs> yeah, this great America. I had to I, I had to get the whole picture from Carrie James. But when I said amusement park, this was what was going through my mind. I'm just annotating it, y'all. Carrie James Marshall's famous Great America. It's an amusement ride. America. Or as uh Prince said, you know, in that in that posthumously released Welcome to America. This is what it is. But um today is Martin Luther King's birthday. It ain't the holiday, but he was born on the 15th, right? He was born on the 15th of January, 1929, at home. Shout out to the Sweet Auburn neighborhood of Atlanta, still there, house still there, National Park Service. Shout out to all uh, our friends and colleagues, particularly those black folk who stand watch over that district. Uh, we saw the president and the vice president of the United States standing before the tombs of Coretta and Martin King, right down the street from where Dr. King was born there, um, Martin King. Um, he was born around noon. So many people are watching this right at the time Martin Luther King came onto the earth. And if you know somebody in this country or in this world, in the United States or beyond, if you know anybody, somebody anywhere who's 93 years old, Dr. King will, would have, if he had lived, and uh, as a black man in America, he may not have made the 90s, but if he had lived and had good health and great health and health care and all kind of stuff he was calling for and where do we go from here, which we'll talk about in a minute, he would have made the 90s. If he had made it in 93, he'd be joining them today physically. But we know he's a very powerful ancestor. Um, but before we get to Dr. King, Professor Hunter, I want to thank you and thank our sister Tanya Pinkins and thank that whole cast for plying their best efforts as actors in Mothers of the Movement. Women, um, women I'm of the sorry. Movement. I say mothers. Yeah, women, you know, it's hard for me because it's interesting because I always read through, see gender doesn't, well, gender doesn't mean anything to me anyway, as a, as a, I mean, I can't, you know, this the Africana lenses. So I'm thinking when you think men, women, those are abstract concepts. So the relational dynamic is what determines right. how people. So I'm thinking governance. In other words, you know, there are a lot of different realities. So yeah, I'm sorry. Women, no, no, I, I keep making the same mistake. Well, no, no, no. The mistake is, is women are the movement. Mother, man. <laughs> you know Tanya, Tanya playing the mother. I just mm -hmm. see a lot of mother. Yeah, so it feels right, mother of the movement. No, it is right. That's the whole point. That's the whole thing. Right. It, what's wrong is when the West abstracts, this is why the work of, among many, many other folk, in fact, the Nigerian uh, scholar, uh, Oyewanke Oyewumi, and her book, The Invention of Women, is so important. She's when you start disembodying gender, and the reason I'm looking around is because it's a brand new book I just got, and I just began to read on this question of gender. And this sister draws very heavily on the work of Oye Wumi, and I'm never going to be able to find it because I think I actually moved it to do something else the other day. That's just too damn bad because I would love to cite this book, and I just got it, so I don't remember the title. Give me about Oh, look at that. Yeah, I moved it down. To, I just got, you see, I still got the sales receipt. 
This is fascinating. Uh, Sylvia uh, Tamale, I hope I'm saying her name right. She's at uh, Makarere University, a professor of law, actually, in Uganda. Shout out to the East Africans. Decolonialism, decolonization and Afrofeminism. Sylvia Tamale. And she's very interesting. Very interesting because, uh, in fact, Professor Oyewumi writes a blurb on the back. It's one of the things, you know, I'm scrolling through looking. This is very, but, but one of the things, you know, that is mentioned and in fact, or you want or you roomy with another book. See, this is where I'm glad we have um, on our team, uh, Dr. Watkins, Valethea Watkins, who's done a lot of work in this area. She wrote a, uh, what's the name of her anthology? Or you want anthology? One of them um, are all, no, is womanhood, motherhood, or are all women mothers? Somebody in newbie will look this up and drop it in the chat and remind me because I'd have to go back search for it. But my point is this, you know, uh, Dr. Watkins always makes this point. Uh, let me use an example from her when she says, you know, we say rape, for example, is a women's issue. Not to the members of her family. What is a woman's issue? What's a man's issue when you're talking about community? We have to address that very seriously. And, and it's a difficult conversation. But in order to have difficult conversations and to resolve them, we got to have a common language. We have to be able to have conversations with each other. and so. Um, my, one of my former students, actually, who uh, is a journalist and, you know, fairly well known young sister, uh, Jamila Lemieux, she just wrote a piece from Vanity Fair. I was reading it where she's, you know, really kind of giving a critique of Dave Chappelle's recent body of work and talking about, you know, LBGTQ issues and trans queer folk of African descent and how, you know, this is an erasure in her opinion of uh, her estimation of how Chappelle is looking. And she's citing a lot of folks, including another one of my former students, Brittany Cooper, Crunk Feminist Collective. And I appreciate the fact that what uh, Jamila is trying to do and Brittany and all of them are really trying to do is engage in, in, in I guess, a variation of a governance analysis. Um, and as I've said, with Jamila, so we've been together. We were down at, at Morehouse, Atlanta University Center, um, Presence Day a few years ago, talking about these things. And I said, you know, I am in defense of and support of and organizing with and being community with every African, including every African in harm's way. So I'm not going to make a distinction. Now, that becomes difficult when we begin to import social structure language, because then we miss each other in the conversations. And I think that is a challenge that we all have. And one of the, another of the countless reasons I'm so um, grateful for Nubia and for narrative and for this space that we are building and really just taking off exponentially is that this is a place where we can have those difficult, critical conversations without this insertion of these less than useful, in fact, many times harmful ways of thinking through. So uh, there aren't just mothers in this series that found its way into social structure media uh, that is based on Mamie Till's book um, that still has some subtle edits that clearly show that everything that goes through Hollywood goes through Hollywood, uh, the lesson that we have to learn. Um, and when Hollywood gets involved, when social structure media, when social structure ways of movement and memory and culture meaning making get involved, they are going to disrupt our conversations, even when they claim they're doing otherwise. And, you know, since Sidney Poitier made transition since last week, we talked about Poitier. You know, I've been reflecting on things and things just like, oh, man, I forgot to talk about that. Oh, yeah, I forgot to. You know, one thing came to my mind was Howard Rollins. Who, of course, you know, if how how if if. if if Howard Rollins hadn't experienced the assaults of living in this amusement park, which ain't so funny, great America, you know, with his battles against addiction and all those other things, we might not be talking about Denzel Washington in the way that we talk about it. Remember Charles Fuller's play, A Soldier's Play, that was made into the film A Soldier's Study Story. It was Rollins that was the lead character and Denzel Washington was a supporting character. And it, you know, But uh, anyway, these are, you know, winners and losers are curated by Hollywood. And so when we look at women, I had to think about it, which is great. I'm never going to not think. Women of the movement, there are more than just mothers there, but the mother ethos. And not the mother read through the Western lens, because motherhood is diminished 
by the Western lens because mothers aren't valued in Western cultures. And by not valued, I don't mean they're not loved, they're not beloved, but they're put in the velvet cage of love and beloved. So you get the whole sense of motherhood is a very restricted thing. This is why Oyuwanki, uh, Oyuwumi, um, Professor Oyuwumi, Oyuwanki, Oyuwumi, uh, her edited book where she talks about this, 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 this tension comes into play. But in thinking about the book is what gender is motherhood? What gen there you oh, of course. See, I was gonna mess it up. And, and that came out of Nubia. So thank you, Nubians. Thank you, Nubians. Yes. And there it is in the question. Answer that question. What gender is motherhood? So, but, the whole, <laughs> so, but mothers of the women of the movement, this is why I wanted to, yeah. I went, I just wanted what, you you you've been talking about this, I know, since it, since before it came out. Yeah. What do you, you know, you have any thoughts about that? Yeah, I mean, you know, Tanya's on my show, Tanya Pinkins. Of course. Every every Wednesday she's Our on uh, as a co-host. And uh, she's just phenomenal. Um, mm -hmm. So when she was talking about doing the tour and everything, I was like, okay. I didn't want to watch it because, you know, we we extensively went through Emmett Till's story and Mo's right. And, I mean, you did a whole thing on him and standing in court, Darhi and his religious background. I mean, it was powerful to sit here and I was like how are they going to do this justice you know but last night's uh, Thursday night's episode directed by Julie Dash and I love that they're bringing the Julie boys. Dash come on they LA they, Rebellion that's Holly Green was right or die that crew that came out of UCLA that's what I'm, I'm saying like you know Tanya's in it Adrian um I can't and I can't think of her name Adrian ah, Glenn Turman, you got Ray Fisher. Ray um, Fisher, my man. Ray Fisher bounced back from that uh yeah. that, yeah. that debacle with DC, didn't he? <laughs> Brilliantly. And but every episode is directed by a black woman. Come on now. And the the creator is a black woman, first time show running. And so the the lens of it feels very governance structure. Adrian Warren. Adrian Warren, thank you. Yeah. Oh, she's brilliant. Oh my goodness. Adrian Warren is is killing it. <sighs> All the not even all the awards. She gets all the accolades. That that woman's incredible. Yeah, yeah. but all of all, all of them though. All of yeah. them. I'm loving all of them. Yes. So the first the first two episodes I I'm I'm more tied to because it is relationship. You know, it's the dinner table with Moe's and you know Emmett. Like all of us, like can I go down south with my cousins and I want to hang out? And he's promising, you know, fresh air and he's gonna be in the fields. He's gonna learn about fishing and all of the things and. You know, she didn't want to send her child down south, you know, because it's still it's troublesome, you know. But I spent my summers down south. You grew up down south. So no from, question. from yeah. Jersey to south, you know, every no summer question. with my grandmother in Augusta burning garbage and dirt roads. Come on now. Moss hanging from the trees. What y'all know about burning garbage? But this Come is Nubia. So all them Africans and all them Negroes in the Caribbean know about burning garbage along with the deep south. But yeah. <laughs> And all you Negroes in the North who brought that Southern stuff up there, so it's why Chicago, you go on the raw street or Newark, you like, what the hell? These Negroes are burning garbage. Right, yeah. <laughs> you know, and those are memories, fond memories, you know. Yeah, and so yeah, he, as he's begging to go, I'm like, I understood, you know. I also understood, you know, her, her hesitancy to let him go and the foreboding, like, you know, it ain't safe. Mm. And he's like, oh, I'll take care of him, you know. And, and he told him not to go to town. But, you know, you, you we know what's going to happen, but to watch the relationships play out and even the relationship between Mamie and, and Ray Fisher's character, you know, and they're Kojic. And I'm like, OK, so are they together? Like, or they're not married. Uh, so well, no I'm, question. I'm working through that. You know, you, like, these are these are governance, you know, ways of knowing y'all know what that is. Y'all know what that is. Or oh, they divorce. They route divorce. Y'all don't know African people, you know, and we even got names for it. Oh, that's my little boyfriend. <laughs> well, we got to a certain age, little boy. I mean, you get to a certain age, a little boyfriend. That's a, a we don't even say boyfriend, we say friend. Mom's little friend. friend, yes, yes. yes. <laughs> Why people don't even understand? Y'all even know what y'all you we, we having a whole conversation in the language you stuffed in our mouths, but we which we absorbed into our languages and made a language that we can talk to you in your face and don't understand. So, <laughs> so of course, they together, yeah, they even know they. <laughs> You know, the, the last the, this last episode was a little tough because, it, you know, it's them, you know, how they move, which is why they need. What is that? What is that? They have the resources. to find Is that I don't know. that's you? Hold up. Let me mute myself. Yeah. Maybe I'm trying to pull it up. All right. Yeah. Stop, stop it. <laughs> right. All right. I'm going to mute you. All right. So there. Uh, did you fix it? 
Let me see. Yes. Okay. I did. Yeah, yeah, I did. I did. All I right. did. I was trying to pull it up. They were actually in in Simeon, uh, not Simeon Booker. They were in uh, uh, TRM Howard, Theodore Roosevelt Howard's office there. And of course, we know Mount Bayou, oh. which is you know, and which is where Mamie, of course, had to stay. And and I and I'll be just very candid. I I haven't watched the first two episodes, and as you're talking, I'm reflecting on. You've you've given voice to why I probably haven't. Um, have you seen this uh relatively new? I think it came out last year. I only saw it this week. Uh movie the 24th. I don't think I have. Yeah, the 24th is uh, I saw it uh the other night on stars, middle of the night, you know, reading and I can't sleep. Let me turn. Um it is on the 24th infantry, which in uh of the Buffalo Soldiers, all black regiment which was uh, many of them were court-martialed and, and some were executed uh, because in 1917, they were stationed in Houston, Texas and the white boys kept messing with them. And then they assaulted a black woman in town. Uh, the rumor got back to the base that one of them had been killed. And so those brothers got their guns and went and handled their business. Shout out to the 24th. Uh, of course, then they were court-martialed mass imprisonment many were executed and i think in the george herbert walker bush administration they were granted pardons um 1917 i want to say who was that teddy roosevelt that's just before wilson uh the, the, the overt racist uh, booker t washington appealed to state the executions i mean a number of things but anyway you know when you watch those kind of things it reminds me of misha green and and, and um and lovecraft country you know, we feel all of that. And so in the Africana Studies framework that we, we developed and we continue to work with, that category, the difference, the reason why we had to make a difference between cultural meaning making and movement and memory is because in the African world in the United States of the 1950s, there was certain music. Um you know, when 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 Mamie Till is standing at the window and looking out and she she sees Bobo, she sees him out there at the, at the telephone pole and she's got the radio on and you hear only you can make our day seem bright. Only you in that room. You hear the platters. You know. That's cultural meaning making. That was the popular music of the day. And when you hear that, if you grew up during that time or any time, you know, for me, it was my parents' age, you know, but we heard that music in the house. You know, go my grandfather. You hear that music on the radio. They played that music because it was the soundtrack of their lives. And so that's cultural meaning making. But then movement and memory is a distinct category for this reason. How did or do African people remember that moment? We remember Emmett Till, though we were not alive because it has been passed down. Emmett Till has been elevated to um, a kind of revered ancestor. I'm not going to use the Western terms of saint. Um, he's not an Orisha to use a, to use a term out of West Africa, he, he, but he is an, he's, an, he's an elevated ancestor. He is an elevated ancestor because, to use a language out of the Western variations on, on Christianity, he was martyred. He's a martyr. Even although his, his killing was not directly political, it was absolutely political. Because remember, 1955 is a year after Brown versus Board of Education. And while it could have and maybe would have happened in Mississippi in spite of that, or the south side or the west side of Chicago, or anywhere in the world for that matter, he his death is a response to this weaponized aggression as if they need any reason to be weaponized coming out of these racists. And uh, we understand, I can't imagine what those writers rooms were like and what kind of edits came back and what kind of notes came back to try to quote unquote humanize these people who cannot be humanized in, in little remarks like, you know, there are whites who will charge them. You got good white people in because everybody knows those two are rednecks. Those mm -hmm. Those two, I'm saying, I can see you can see in the writers' room them saying, "Well, put that in," because you know we can't just have everybody thinking white. Right. Yeah, because and that's one of the reasons why I haven't watched those first two episodes yet, because we all know I work. I've spent majority of my working life, most majority of my life, certainly almost all my adult life, 
working with children, including teenagers and 20 somethings and 30 something, but a lot of teenagers. In here. So, I mean, I'm looking at, I'm, I, I see the, the preview and I'm like, this is, this is too much. For me, it's like watching the 24th. When I see that white boy go up on that porch in Houston and this black woman is out here with her infant in, in, in swaddling clothes and this cracker hits her in the face while the baby is crying on the porch, I'm like, I want to murder everything moving today, today. So rather than get the strap and go out in a blaze of glory, I go back to this. Why? This, this is what Jacob Carruthers call intellectual warfare. I don't forgive and I don't forget. So therefore, I'm going to murder the ideas that animate that behavior. Will absolutely end for all time. <laughs> for all time. Any concept that would allow this type of brutal anti-life, anti-human, anti-existence behavior that somehow you picked up and passed on from generation to generation to generation, we're going to kill it. And when I say I, I don't mean I. Again, first person pronoun fails. Collectively, we must end that. But in those moments, it's too much. Mm. It's too much. And so watching episodes three and four, it's also too much, but the too much in those moments are, are shot through with what we have always done. There was a brother, uh, I never forget, uh, this has been about six or seven years ago. Um, what's my man out of Chicago now? Uh, I always tell young people, well, y'all love Kendrick Lamar, but there was a Kendrick Lamar right before Kendrick Lamar. What's the brother who... Uh, He's still around. He's hip hop, still very active. Chance the rapper? No, 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 no. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I shouldn't say that. Like, no, 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 no. But yeah, I should. No, mm -hmm. no, no, no. Uh, his sister. Uh, Common? No, 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 no. You said Chicago rapper, hip hop. What? His sister taught at uh, and teaches at the Jacob Carruthers Center, and he, good sister. We uh, we talked about. I haven't talked to either one of them in quite some time. You know, kind of thin, wears glasses. Well, all right, kind of looked like Kendrick, got them little, you know, uh, Fulani features out of West Africa, uh, Ethiopian features. It's going to come to my mind in a minute. Give me a song. Oh, you know, I can't name that. I'm blanking now because I ain't thinking about hip hop in that sense. It'll switch over in a minute. Oh, he got little locks. He kind of reminds you of Kendrick, Damn. which is crazy. I'm blocking now. But anyway, he came, they showed a little film called. Uh, the Revenge of Emmett Till. He'll come to me in a minute. Oh, my girl is, uh, he, she's real close with him. They got a thing where they do education. Nikki Jean, Nikki's out of Minneapolis. They got a, anyway, it'll come to me in a minute. Anyway, I'll, let me do what Francis Chris Welsing said, which is when you're trying to think of something, just ask your brain Lupe the question. Fiasco? Lupe. Okay. Yeah, Lupe. Yeah. God. Thank you. And Thank you, Nubian. All the newbies like Lupe, 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 Thanks, Lupe. Lupe. Yeah, got, okay, I'm looking. Thank you. Thank you. Lupe, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, thank, thank you. you thank you yeah, y'all for Lupe. Right. No question. Which is making my point. I make to the young people. I say, this is how short our memory is. I mean, y'all talking about Kendrick and hey, I got love for Kendrick. No problem. I'm saying, but y'all, did y'all forget about Lupe? Lupe was doing, but there's a generation now don't know who Lupe is. Anyway, but yeah, Lupe, his sister. They brought this film, The Death of Emmett Till, because they got a cat who's down with them, their family. And some of y'all may have seen this film. I mean, not The Death, The Revenge, where Emmett Till gets revenge. You remember J.D.'s Revenge? Talk about Glenn Turman. That, now we dig in the crate. No, that's Liberation of L.B. Jones. So, anyway, we're going to get into the films. We did that last week. Um, We know what's going to happen, as you said. But these second two episodes, uh, episodes three and four, we see the fight back. And see the lessons that we went through extensively, TRM Howard. And uh, you mentioned before we've gone on Ruby Hurley. Mm. And we talked about Mega Evers and them cats. We talked about uh um, what's my man, Amzie Moore and them, whose son also professor, Chicago State University, um, good friend of mine. Uh, those Mississippi cats that Bob Moses and you know Marimba Ani and all them, you know, Dory Ladner, Joyce Ladner and them, Charlie Cobb said, you know. These were the people in Mississippi when we came at SNCC and in, and, and in Dory and Joyce's case, you know, from Hattiesburg, they were there. But these are the ones who brought us in, who showed us how to move. And so what we see in those episodes is, you know, when Hurley is out there in the field with the sister, you know, I'm not 
no, I came from the NAACP. I need to find out. And they find those other cats. And we walk through, like you said, we, we walk through all that in Nubia, uh, in narrative. We, we walk through all that, you know, and in class. But to see it that way, it reminds us that we don't ever give up. And so it ain't even really about a conviction. At that point, this is chapters, episodes three and four. I'm looking and experiencing, albeit with these edits, governance. This is who we are to each other. When the boy walks up on the reporter, you got the black press pressing them. And then the cat comes up. Yeah, I know his name, but he ain't gonna talk to no reporter. So you got to go to the bar now in the middle of the night <laughs> and talk to the sister. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? In other words, you watching governance. But this country, this social structure wants to narrate everything in terms of who we are to them. So that's why something like uh, Women of the Movement would be considered a revelation. It puts a face, it humanizes. We never stop being human. Oh, I'm sorry, we did to you. These are the stories that we have to compile. But anyway, I won't get too far. But you mentioned Ruby Hurley, which I think was, was a glaring oversight. We should have spent more time on her, uh, time on her at all when we talked about all those people in the field because she's a central figure. And the way she uh, clapped back the white boy, um, the, the cop who came in and she stood up, she got up out her chair. And I was like, she ain't from there. She ain't from Mississippi because she wasn't scared at all. Well, Charlie Cobb in his book, That Nonviolent Stuff Will Get You Killed, talked about many people from Mississippi who did that. The, the, the illusion is that they wouldn't do it, but she definitely wasn't out of D.C. Yeah. DC. Dunbar High School and... Uh, uh, minor teachers college institutions we've talked about and thanks y'all so many people they putting in the chat the uh maybe tell the marshall fields oh iris remembers her yeah because she was a uh, yeah her husband uh they're buried together in the same cemetery there we talked about park cemetery where emmett is and uh i want to say that um miss alma is there too alma smith alma smith carthen who tiny is playing is there in oak hill as well um and yes yes Sing Network makes the point. Frances Cress Wilson is from Chicago. She and her sister, Lauren Cress. Mm. Chicago, no question, no question. Which, uh, of course, you know. Oh, and Tanya's from Chicago, and she's in the chat, too. Hey, Tanya, what's up? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, no, nah, yeah, no. Nah, you're right. You're absolutely right. I saw a comment say, uh, Ricardo, so you can't get anything past the newbie community. You can't get anything past the community. This is why we do this together. And so those of you who are in YouTube saying, no, should I get into that? Well, we're annotating right now, but you can't see that. You got to come in for that. So we annotate. It's being annotated, which is the whole point. But yeah, we 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 will spend some time. You you said uh, before we got on that we need to do some more. You should know, and there are, there are many things to do, and and we have to do that because you we should know Ruby Hurley. And before we get into um, MLK, yes, born, born this day, nineteen twenty nine. Mm -hmm. uh, there's one other thing that kind of underscores. You know, where do we go from here? Community or chaos? Mm -hmm. Um. Mose Wright put his hand on a Bible that they had a strip across written colored. And to me, it was the most American thing in the whole series, because that's the hypocrisy that your Bible, you wanted to put colored on the Bible. Like y'all had to swear in on different Bibles. What God do you serve? It was so poignant to me. Um, just that little, it was just a little thing. But here's the beautiful thing about it, though. I know, you know, for me, I'm like, I'm good with that. <laughs> I'm good with that. Because <laughs> because y'all know nothing about Moses, right? <laughs> that man, a man of God. So whatever he's taking the oath to ain't what you taking the oath to. Give me the one you got for me. Give me the like, colors Bible. Give you the colors only Bible. Look, like those mandate blacksmiths who came from West Africa, who became the blacksmiths of New Orleans, who put up them fences around them white churches in New Orleans and Charleston, places like that. Like uh, like I was having a conversation, as I told you all one time, I was in um, I was in Charleston for this one. We were walking downtown. This is this is the time I went in at Port Libation at a wedding in Mother Emanuel AME. This is many years ago. Uh, in fact, Reverend Pinkley, you know, still alive there. Uh, it's before Dylan Roof. But um. You know, walking around downtown Charleston, looking at these churches, having a conversation. And one one of the brothers, South Carolinians, was like, "Yeah, these are this is beautiful ironwork." I said, "Yeah, these are the Africans." He said, "Yeah," he said, and they put all kind of symbols in that ironwork around the church because they said, 
Y'all want us to build this fence? No problem. I'm enslaved. That's a problem. We'll, we'll, we'll work our way out. But then Bambara and all them other people and all them other people, them Igbo people, they like, uh, particularly, no, particularly the Mende and Bambara, you know, the iron workers. They say, no problem. We'll build this fence. And we're going to put designs in the fence. Oh, this is beautiful. Mm hmm. That's your church. No problem. We'll build a fence. Why? Because whatever you praying to in there, we're going to put a fence around it and pray to what we pray to to keep that shit in there. <laughs> so the whole point is that, uh, you know, anyway, it's a, it's a whole. In fact, you know, let me pause here. Let me pause here and see if I can. Yeah. My man, Haki My Booty, Third World Press, Chicago. This is a book, a little book of poetry called Emmett Till in Different States by Philip Cullen. Let's go to Grandma Alma. Tanya, this one's for you. You probably, I'm sure you've read this, but for everybody else, this is what uh, the poet Philip Colin in a book published in the Black Press, Emmett Till in Different States, writes about Grandma Alma. Says, she was the guardian soul of the family. I used to think she knew God's personal address and phone number. She quoted him almost every hour and kept a big black book with all his numbers and sayings underlined in red and blue with an exclamation point. I thought she knew all of God's children, too. But so many of them had the same first name. There were two Timothys, two Maccabees, and three Johns. How God and Grandma Alma kept them all apart was a real chore. She wanted me to get a good education because all of God's favorite sons, Peter, Matthew, and that hard-ass Paul, wrote important letters. And next to God, for Grandma Alma, came good spelling and bloody knuckle manners. In the corner, she kept a salvation pad paddle just to make sure we was polite. But she figured she liked Moses best of all, since he was God's sheriff. Grandma had a unique way of getting the Holy Spirit across. Hell was headquartered on a Delta plantation where all her kin grew up. But when they moved up north to Argo, the devil must have relocated too. Because all of that hatred and sinning on the south side. <laughs> By the way, he writes in the voice of Emmett Till writing letters. And he takes the letter. He's talking about his grandmother there. And he, he goes all the way up to um, writing letters to Trayvon Martin, weeping over Chicago, writing letters to Martin Luther King. It's all in the form of poetry. But the point is that that Bible that they had Moses Wright swear on to say color on it, got the same words in it, the one that they call white. Except y'all stuffed that Bible in our heads and we absorbed it into our ways of knowing. And if you know anything about, quote unquote, the black church, then you know who we call the devil. Same book. So even if they didn't have the label colored on the outside of the book in Moe's right mind, the label African was in there, although he wouldn't have called it African. In other words, I read the same book you read, but we read it two completely different ways, <laughs> which is why the Rastas call your place Babylon. And we call it the land of Egypt, which is a tragedy in a, mis in a historical way, but spiritually in terms of ways of knowing y'all Pharaoh tragedy. But anyway, uh yes good look thank you thank you julie y'all putting third world foundation in man i'm so glad that uh the tiny is here okay so yes um but this this question of being vulnerable that's very powerful and we could tie that to martin luther king <sighs> what happens when we're watching women of the movement which really is communities of the movement because each one of those stories is community. But you know, I understand the social structure we live in because it, it made the fractured, gendered uh, divisions with an attempt to place maleness, white maleness at the center of all power and reality. So they got to work their way back from that. One of these days, we're going to come about that mess. But as we continue to build narrative, we're going to make our own fully unrestricted movies. We... We, we that sense of loss is real. Emmett is so alive, you know. Um, Simeon is so alive. I mean, these kids, boys, and boys and girls are so alive, and then you but you know what's coming. So, but we don't lose hope. Let's quote Martin Luther King. Martin King in his life uh published four books. Uh, let me see. I pulled I I pulled um paperback versions for a very deliberate reason rather than go get the uh go find the, the hardbacks in the original first editions 
I wanted to pull these because the beautiful thing about it is in terms of movement and memory, his books are always in print. They've never been out of print. 1958, he did one called Stride Toward Freedom. All right. Here's the little cheap paperback, the perennial Harper and Row of 1958. This is Montgomery Bus Boycott. 1963, uh, one that I'm going to read from in a second, Why We Can't Wait. All right. And he also did uh, Strength to Love. This is the little uh, pocket books edition, Strength to Love. Right. And then, of course, he was killed in 1968. But um, he published this one, 1964, no, 67. Where do we go from here? Chaos the Community. I think this is the one we're going to read. We'll make this the March read. And, letter, and then, Letters from a Birmingham Jail, that was just uh, letters. That wasn't a book. No, no. Although uh, it is included I think in why we can't wait if memory serves me correctly. Yeah. Letter from Birmingham jails, chapter five in uh, why we can't wait. In fact, let's go to why we can't wait. I'm going to go in terms of thinking about women of the movement. And by the way, y'all know, uh, Professor and I don't plan this. So we knew we were going to talk about Martin Luther King, but let's go for a second to chapter seven. The summer of our, no, 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 no. Yeah, the summer of our discontent. The summer of our discontent. Chapter seven of why we can't wait. King opens this book, dedicating it to his children. Yolanda, Martin III, Dexter, uh, Bernice. For whom I dream that one day soon they will no longer be judged by the content, the color of their skin, but the content of their characters. We've heard many times, as you're going to hear more times than you want to hear on uh, on Monday in the United States of America. Um, and shout out to Johnny John Roberts and his crew. Uh, I really like John Roberts. John Roberts is taking, uh, you know, you tore up your little court with both your hands. And then Mitch McConnell and them took it off from there, stole two Supreme Court seats, got Judge McConnell. Actually, yeah, got Judge McConnell Gorsuch on. Beer Kavanaugh is quote unquote legit, so to speak, because, yeah, you know, after y'all got the election. You, and then you stole that last one by ramming the handmaid on uh, five seconds before while, while people were already voting. You know, but, you know, I respect Mitch McConnell. I mean, you know, your old spook, your old ghoul. <laughs> trying to hold on to your little fr uh, fragmenting thing, thing coming apart like tissue paper. But, uh, you know, when, when you read that National Federation of uh, Independent Businesses and Applicants uh, versus uh, the Department of Labor in Ohio, that Supreme Court case where they said that uh, uh, you can't require uh, Occupational Health and Safety Administration OSHA standards, uh, can't you federal government cannot require folk to be vaccinated beyond health care workers. You can read that whole opinion, and as they say in dissent, as uh, Kagan and her colleagues and so do me, you, of course, Breyer says in dissent, and then Roberts joins them um, for part of the case. We, what you have to understand is they're saying that the majority opinion in that Supreme Court case from last week is saying that OSHA has never um, it, OSHA has never positively articulated that it had that authority, so therefore it, it, it exceeded it's statutory authority. And the dissent is like, yeah, it doesn't have to. Occupational health and safety. It doesn't have to be explicit. And of course, Clarence Thomas mad anyway, because he said he, you shouldn't even be able to do it for healthcare workers. But the fact that they allowed healthcare workers uh, to still have to, uh, so to be subjected to the mandate and exempted everybody else tells you everything you need to know about this activist court. Meaning what? Every, really a lot of you have to know about statutory interpretation and judicial decision making. The judge is interpreting what the law means. So people think that, and this is a, this is an absolutely understandable uh, reaction to legal opinions. People think that you have to find the actual language in the law to be able to make a decision to say this law. You know, no, no, you can make it up. Judges do it all the time. Statutory interpretation. And if they don't like it, 
then they simply look aside because you know the strict. Uh, let me let me pause because I'm about to get into strict construction and original originalists and all this kind of thing. Just know this: last week they did what they wanted to do politically, and we, we can talk more about that. Maybe we do that for current office hours. But Dr. King, the sum of our discontent. And the reason I've mentioned that Supreme Court case is because, you know, John Roberts started us down this road, not with just Shelby County. He started us down this road with Citizens United 2010. And John Roberts' whole thing, you know, is that the Constitution is colorblind and content of the character. He's going to be somewhere talking about content of character on Monday, too. But he done tore up his country now. And he, you can't back map now because you can count. And now they don't need your vote, Johnny John, John John. They got the handmade beer. And uh, McConnell on the court. So they could, you know, Clarence Thomas and Alito, like, come on, friends, we got five. We can count to five. We done. Tear, tear it up. But uh, Dr. King dedicated this book to his children with the content of the character line, which has been radically misinterpreted. But I want to go to chapter seven for a second. Thinking about, again, mothers of the movement, thinking about the idea that this impending doom, they're going to kill this boy. And so we looking at him laughing and smiling, knowing what's about to happen to him. And then, you know, this feeling that he can't be saved, so to speak. Dr. King writes this. The summer of our discontent. He says more than 25 years ago, one of the Southern states adopted a new method of capital punishment. Poison gas supplanted the gallows. In its earliest stages, a microphone was placed inside the sealed death chamber so that scientific observers might hear the words of the dying prisoner to judge how the human reacted in this novel situation. Pause there. How sick a society you got to be to put a microphone in a death house chamber and stick the gas in there and you want to capture what the last thing is this human being does? How sick. King continues. The first victim was a young Negro. As the pellet dropped into the container and the gas curled upward through the microphone came these words. Save me, Joe Lewis. Save me, Joe Lewis. Save me, Joe Lewis. King writes, it is heartbreaking enough to ponder the last words of any person dying by force. It is even more poignant to contemplate the words of this boy because they reveal the helplessness, the loneliness and the profound despair of Negroes in that period. The condemned young Negro groping for someone who might care for him and had power enough to rescue him found only the heavyweight boxing champion of the world, Joe Lewis, would care because he was a Negro. Joe Lewis could do something because he was a fighter. In a few words, the dying man had written a social commentary, not God, not government, not charitably minded white men, but a Negro who was the world's most expert fighter in his last extremity was the last hope. Save me, Joe Lewis. One of our Nubians posted on social media yesterday a small clip. Did you see the Muhammad Ali and Martin Luther King? Did you see that, Professor Hunter? I don't know if you saw it. I didn't. I didn't see it. It's a beautiful clip. Only about a minute. Uh, they had had a private meeting, and you see Muhammad Ali, Ralph Abernathy, and Martin Luther King. Abernathy just smiling. They all smiling, but Abernathy just, man, he just grinning. So these white reporters, what did y'all talk about? Muhammad Ali says, we're not going to tell you none of your business. In that moment, social structure, governance structure. What y'all talk about? None of your business. Then Dr. King says, well, uh, you know how King is. We uh, had a good meeting. And of course, we would not uh, reveal uh, the content of our meeting here. And uh, we understand that while we may have some differences in our religions, we are of one accord. And then Ali has got his hand around the whole time. He said, this is my brother. This is my brother. You know, young and beautiful. Save me, Joe Lewis.
the movement and memory category. How did or do we remember our resistance to this insane, anti-human, anti-life, anti-reality social structure we live in? How do we remember Martin King? That category in our Africana studies framework applied to answer this question brings us to a fundamental contradiction between how the social structure tries to curate our memories as African people, tries to curate the memory of all oppressed peoples in various situations, and how we curate it. The script of settler colonial social structure logics is so predictable you can write it for them. I don't know if you saw the sister, our sister in uh, Barbados, Mia Moore Motley, Motley, Motley mm -hmm. called a snap election a couple of weeks ago in Barbados. Of course, a snap election you can call when you want to replace the government or you want to remain in power. And she called the election. Why? Because Mia Moore Motley and the Barbadian government have set up embassies with African countries, Ghana and Kenya, a few others. She is leading the Caribbean community, the Caribbean community political formation called CARICOM toward talks about greater cooperation. And maybe one day you get a United States of the Caribbean. Mia Moore Motley led Barbados to tell the queen, take that it back to England. And you can come visit any time, but we no longer rule by you, not even symbolically. Mia Moore Motley has slowly, you can almost write the script, you'll begin to see now the criticisms. Why? But Barbados is tiny. Well, hell, Grenada was tiny. You can't let Maurice Bishop and them get away with that. Cuba is tiny. You can't let Fidel Castro and them get away with These Negroes is bucking. <laughs> and when you start bucking and start talking about cooperating with other black countries, so they they would don't line, they lining her up slowly. You know, you got to do it because she's completely untouchable in terms of how she moves through the world. Third, fourth generation political family in Barbados. Third generation, no, grandfather was involved in politics. She's at the United Nations straight up. I had certain remarks, but I'm going to get these other remarks. Oh, she got Rihanna on her team. So you can't just take her out. You know what I'm saying? So you got to build it. So what does Motley do before they figure out some kind of way to put some case on it? She says, I'm going to call a snap election. Why? Because we are no longer under the crown. And I think we should have an election so that the people can elect their first government that's not under the British crown. Ha, did you see that coming? Why? She knows she gonna win the election. But what she not gonna do is wait for y'all cause y'all done got y'all on y'all little map called stop these Negroes from bucking. You got 2023 circled. She's up for election then. By then we can bloody her up. I ain't up for election in 2023. Why? Cause I'm gonna call an election at the end of 2020 and extend my stuff another bit. Ha <laughs> ha, yeah. Checkmate. Now, <laughs> you got to love it. You know what I'm saying? You got to love it. So I'm saying. That's strategy. Yes, it is. And when you have strategy combined with a governance structure you control, you could do that. In the United States of America, narrative Nubia. Black institutions. In Barbados, we got the country. Now, what happens when Negroes who don't have a country get with Negroes that control one. Well, now we can go to where do we go from here? Actually, we ain't got to do that. Let me go to why we can't wait. Let me go back to why we can't wait. Is why we can't wait? No, no. Because this is mostly about Birmingham. This is mostly about Birmingham. Hold for a second. Let me see here if I can uh, because, you know, thinking about Martin Luther King's um, hold on. Oh, no. I'm going to mention this one to y'all. If you only get one book by Dr. King that isn't one of his books, actually, this is one of his books, but this is mostly speeches and sermons he gave. It's a very good book. It's called In a Single Garment of Destiny, A Global Vision of Justice. Martin Luther King, Louis Baldwin, Danny Vanderbilt, good brother, edited this. 
This is a, these are a great number of Dr. King, including some quotes from some of these books, particularly uh, the world community from where do we go from here, which we will be reading. Um, this is in six parts, a number of Dr. King's pronouncements and discussions around global liberation struggles. There's a beautiful chapter in here. One of my favorite uh, sermons that Dr. King gave that's called um, The Birth of a New Nation, where he's talking about when he went to Ghana. And when he talks about where he went to Ghana, uh, because see, here's the problem they have in the United States. If this Negro going over here, he and Coretta and them over there in Ghana, then why in the world, what the hell? You know, yeah, these are our cousins. These are our people. And in fact, King says this, what he learned being in uh, being in Ghana for the independence celebrations, traveling around. Then he said, I came back through England and they took me through Westminster Abbey and I went to the palace and I saw that. And I was like, this is very impressive. And he said, as I stood there, I reflected on the fact that these people put all this on the backs of our back on our backs. And that they don't even believe the words they say. And that one time the sun never set on the British Empire, but the place I just came from broke out and other people broke out and India broke out. And now they ain't got the empire, they said. And that Winston, he said, as I stood there, I, I reflected on the fact that Winston Churchill said, I did not rise to power to become the leader of England in order to reduce the footprint of the, of the British Empire. And he said, I stood there reflecting on the fact that it don't matter what you want. It's time for us to be free, and we have decided enough is enough. This is the Martin Luther King that's not going to be talked about on Monday because the attempt is to domesticize him, to keep him in the U.S. social structure. So all of the propaganda will be focused on 1963, I have a dream, and not even the whole speech and all that. And then they're going to, you know, stick a, get you to stick a, a, a paintbrush in your hand and go paint a school that you already paid tax dollars to paint. This is Jedi mind tricks, boy. And so all they talking about service. Like, where, where my tax money, though? Because Dr. King was writing about where the tax money is. Dr. King and where do we go from here? Chaos or community is talking about universal basic income. Dr. King is talking about, you know, housing. Dr. King is talking about education. Dr. King got language in here on reparations. Literally walking through reparations. King makes all these arguments, but no, we ain't going to talk about none of that. We're going to talk about Dr. King and the dogs and the fire hoses and Bull Connor, and now y'all can vote. And so what else the hell do you, what the hell else do you want? Content of character, content of character, colorblind constitution, colorblind constitution. Shut the hell up. You not talking to Dr. King. And so our movement in memory, save me, Joe Lewis, our movement in, movement in memory comes to connecting with the fighting spirit. With the spirit of resistance, Dr. King begins that chapter with that story, and then he goes into why this man called Joe Lewis. Because fighting gives us hope. Fighting gives us hope. Even when the thing looks hopeless, the idea is that there's something that we can do. And so when he writes here about what happened in Ghana, he says, there are four things that we should be reminded of that my experience there reminded me of. He gave this, by the way. This is a sermon he gave April 7th, 1957, Montgomery, Alabama. He's back now. Him and Coretta are back. They're in Dexter Avenue. Because remember, he doesn't leave Dexter Avenue until 1960. In fact, there's a beautiful little book. Oh, man. I may have, I think I mentioned it to y'all before, but I couldn't put my hands on it. It's a great little book called Reflections of Our Pastor. Dr. Martin Luther King at Dexter Avenue Baptist Church, 1954 to 1960. This is uh, Wally Vaughn and Richard uh, Richard Willis. Uh, they edited this book. There's a reflection on this in here from people. These are the people who were in Dr. King's congregation, including a sister, Verdi Davis. She's 97 years old when they interviewed her. She said, I was the one let him in the church. He got there early. He said, I'm here to give a trial sermon. I sat and talked with him. I said, I knew this. This is a bright young man. I mean, so, I mean, who is Martin Luther King to us? We, You got to ask the people who knew him, his family, his people. You know, when Dr. King would get up and say, I'm the son, I'm the grandson, I'm the great grandson of a, of a Baptist minister. And we've talked about that. We're not going to talk about that today. We're going to keep it kind of tight today. Uh, you know, we talked about uh, his great grandfather, Willis Williams who was in an integrated church in Georgia as an enslaved person in the 1840s and 50s. Uh, we talked about uh, Willis and Creasy, his wife, their child, uh, A.D., Adam Daniel, Adam and Eve, uh, uh, to the two children. 
A.D. Williams, the, the child of Creasy Williams and her husband, Willis Williams. Willis Williams was a minister. A.D. grew up to be a minister. A.D. was friends with uh, Henry McNeil Turner, part of that hardcore Georgia contingent that fought and created the Georgia Equal Rights League in the 19th century. And of course, A.D. Williams is the man that Michael King had to ask for his daughter, Alberta's hand in marriage. Mike King came to school to go to Morehouse. A.D. Williams had gone to Morehouse. Wasn't no Morehouse when his daddy and mama came along. But A.D. got married. And so they had Alberta, he and his wife. And Alberta started going with Michael. Mike said, I got to come talk to the old man. The old man was tough. A.D. Williams is tough. Cut off part of his finger in an accident. What are you showing? Man? You ready, man? You ready? For, you built like that? You want my daughter's hand in marriage? Every minister in Dr. King's line, except his father, came through his mother. And so he talks about these. I ain't no politician. And so his, his analysis was always couched in spiritual. Absolutely committed to nonviolence. And we talked about that too extensively with uh, Howard Thurman, you know, the influences on him. Mordecai Johnson himself was a minister, you know, president of Howard University. But, you know, Howard Thurman and Mordecai Johnson and their spouses had gone to sit with Gandhi, had talked to Nehru and them, had, had been in that conversation. And so King is introduced through, oh, I'm sorry, the other figure who really I probably should have mentioned second after Thurman, the great Benjamin Elijah Mays, Benjamin and Sadie Mays on that trip to Gandhi. You see, so King on Monday, they're going to talk about Gandhi. And we got a whole conversation on Gandhi we should have, which we'll have one day about Gandhi and race, which is very important for us to have. And we talked a little bit about how he interacted with them on that trip. In fact, I'm looking over here at Walter Fluker in his book, Vision of a Better World, which talks about that trip. This is before King is anywhere in the conversation. He's a young boy. I mean, he ain't even got into college yet. Now, that haven't been said. All that haven't been said. Dr. King is writing from the position in terms of Africana ways of knowing of a, a culturally grounded worldview that is spiritual in nature. And his politics have to follow his culture. So by the time you get him into this governance conversation, critiquing the social structure we find ourselves in, moving against this oppressive dimensions of that social structure. It's coming from ways of knowing that are very deeply grounded in spiritual traditions that come out of his experience as an African person in the world. And in terms of movement and memory, he is thinking about the black church in some ways that are going to rush up against the way that that black church has formed. But that are going to be trying to be, have fidelity to the greatest aspirations, the deepest, most important moral and ethical principles. And so King, you know, reading the same Bible, by the way, that Mose Wright was reading and probably reading it more like Mose Wright than those white men that would stick a label colored on the cover of the Bible and stick it under Rose Mike's hand, Mose Wright's hand like we had to keep you separate as if it wasn't separate before you even put the Bible under there. Mose Wright know who you are. Darhi. You see the man? <laughs> Darhi. You think I'm scared of y'all? Nah, it's something bigger than y'all, as the Muslims say, and the Christians, but I like to say it, the Muslims say, court in the Quran. Man plans, Allah plans. Allah is the greatest of planners. Human beings plan, God plans. God is the greatest of planners. Meaning what? You can't stop us. You can't stop us. Why? It's you and me having a conversation, but it's something bigger than that. This is why, again, Benjamin Mays with that poetry at Sale Hall when 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 uh, Martin Luther King showed us a 16 year old and he let him in along with them other boys, keep him out of World War II. And, and he's up there reciting from uh, memory John Donne's poetry. And then King picks it up. And then when you hear John, when you hear King saying, that's Benjamin Mays talking to them, truth forever on the scaffold, wrong forever on the throne, but that scaffold holds the future and beyond the dim unknown. Stand as God behind the heavens, keep, keeping watch upon his own. I have a dream today. It's all Dr. King and that's Benjamin Mays. So you don't know who we are to each other. You don't know about our institutions. You don't know about our movement and memory. You don't know anything about our ways of knowing. And so you think that's a some kind of Negro that dropped out the sky instead of all these black institutions that formed him. Which is why when you see another Negro who you like how they talk, they say, oh, Barack Obama is so articulate. Barack Obama couldn't even get on the pulpit of most black churches. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but see, because to you, that's impressive. Even you, Joe. Remember what the mummy said when he was running against him and got beat, got his ass beat? How many times Joe Biden got his ass beat? Then he's the first bright, clean, articulate. Well, clearly, you don't think Jesse Jackson is articulate. So now you just showed us who you are. 
<laughs> Nothing about that. I, you know, she, Shirley I, Chisholm. <laughs> I'm like, come on, man. So, so Dr. King says in this, he says, you know, what did I learn in Ghana? First, the oppressor never voluntarily gives freedom to the oppressed. Then he goes through all that. He said they would never, they'd still be in colonialism in Ghana if they hadn't resisted. He says, second, it reminds us that a nation or a people can break a loose from oppression without violence. See, King's committed to nonviolence. We can debate whether that's good or bad, but at the end of the day, he's saying they didn't fire a shot in Ghana. Now, he's not going to get into the geopolitical analysis here. He will later, but that's important to understand. Mia Moore Motley. She can't beat the, the Barbadians can't beat the Western society with an army. They, they, they're too small. But the move she's making, importantly, will help us understand that you don't have to go to war. If you and Dr. King would say that one reason why we be getting nonviolent tactically for those who don't believe in it as a way of life, like I do. And in fact, uh Septima Clark, we, we call our ancestor. I pulled this. This is the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. They published. Uh, in 1972, a collection of some of Dr. King's speeches and then their reflections on who the King was called Drum Major. Martin Luther King Jr., January 15, 1929, to April the 4th, 1968. And one of the things that Septima Clark writes in here because Dr. King was her friend. She said, I saw him get heckled. I feared for his life many times. He said, she said, I was with him a couple of times when I know he feared for his life, but he never gave up being nonviolent. I was with him times when people got us out of situations where they had guns and they was like, we was going to light them. People. And Dr. King was like, do you think that that would have made us any safer? And so it's Septima Clark is like, I think it probably got you out of that position. But Dr. King himself, no, although we can go back to Montgomery and have another conversation. But the point I'm trying to make at this moment is Dr. King's second point is that um, you can do it without being violent. Now imagine what that looks like when, as he writes in here, as I, in fact, let me just, let me just quote this. Cause I love when, let me see if I can find it. Uh, yeah. Now he's sitting in there, him and Coretta are sitting in the, uh, the ceremony where, where, uh, in the stadium where, well, they were inside and they came out to the big stadium where in and them took power. He says, look over to my right is Adam Powell. To my left is Charles Diggs. Remember Congressman Diggs, who was at the trial of Emmett Till from Michigan, Detroit. To my right again is Ralph Bunch. To the other side is Her Majesty's First Minister of Jamaica, Manning, Ambassador Jones of Liberia. See, it's the problem. You got a Negro from Atlanta, married to a Negro from Marion, Alabama, sitting in Accra with a Negro from New York, one from L.A., one from Detroit, and then here come some Jamaicans. Here's a Liberian. Richard Nixon is representing the United States, the vice president at the time. He's sitting there like, you can't call no war planes. You've been on the phone with the British and the rest of your team and the social structure trying to figure out how y'all can blunt this. In a few years, you're going to have Nkrumah out of power. You saying, hmm, but for today, I got to sit here and eat this. Mordecai Johnson said, let me continue. He says, all those people from America, he said, Mordecai Johnson, Horace Mann Bond, who we talked about Monday night, was very critical of, uh, of uh, Carl G. Woodson's The Miseducation of the Negro in the pages of the Journal of Negro Education. All these people just going over to, to Ghana to say, quote, we want to greet you and we want you to know that you have our moral support as you grow, end quote. King says, then you look out and see the vice president of the United States. You see A. Philip Randolph. You see all the people who have stood in the forefront of the struggle for civil rights over the years coming over to Africa to, to say, we bid you Godspeed. That was a great day, not only for Nkrumah, but for the whole of the Gold, Gold Coast and for us. He goes on and says the fourth thing. Oh, I'm sorry. Third thing was Ghana reminds us that freedom never comes on a silver platter. It's never easy. They're going to have pushback and the pushback is coming slowly then soon and then he says finally Ghana tells us that the forces of the universe are on the side of justice in other words you can't beat us we are organized we're coming together now today is Martin Luther King's birthday and as we think about movement and memory we're reflecting a little bit on the King as he was and King as he will be narrated because 
to the social structure, King serves a very narrow purpose. Don't let them Negroes turn up. Keep them, keep that red, white, and blue flag in front of their faces and tell them don't punch nobody. Meanwhile, we'll continue to shoot and kill them. We'll continue to let the killers go. We'll continue, and every time they complain, we'll just say, hey, trust us, you know, hang with us, as we said before. But the real king, nah, because the president of the United States is not who I report to. I report to God. It's a very different mentality. Now, on the 17th of January, on the 17th of January, we are going to uh, bear witness to another uh, moment that has been curated in movement and memory. This is where I'm going to spend the last couple of minutes today. January 17th, 1961, after being prime minister for just over three months, the first freely elected prime minister of the Democrat Republic of Congo was assassinated, 35 years old. Of course, his name was Patrice Emily Lumumba. Patrice Lumumba, very important figure. Patrice Lumumba, first prime minister of Congo, very important. Um, uh, born 1925. So he was four years older than Dr. King, not quite. He's born in July. Uh, born in Kasai province, small national group, uh, the, Bata, uh, the Bata, Bateta group, Bateta uh, national group. Uh, he was what they would call during the period uh, Evolier. Evolier is like a, an, a continental African, an African person who gets access to white education. He went to a mission school, the Protestants. Uh, he came out. He became, He's a Western educated African. And he uh, started writing. He was writing for the Congolese journals. He got involved in organizing. Uh, he uh, moved to Kinshasa, which they called Leopoldville at the time, of course, to be a postal clerk. He does stuff. He's, you know, organizing. Uh, he gets involved in the trade unions. And it's very important because then he gets involved in politics and we go on and we talk about the fact he launched something called the, uh, the Congolese national movement, 1958. And is swept into power. He goes to the all African people's conference in Accra. See King is there in Ghana and in Krumah take power. And then shortly thereafter, Krumah's like, see you first, the political kingdom, you, you know, we're going to now have the United States of Africa. Let's start getting people in. So you see Mandela in the, there before, you know, Ravonia trial, you see, uh, uh, Lumumba come in there. You see, you know, Sekou Toure, uh, they're going to begin organizing. This is a problem for the social structure because see, they always organized. They organize and then they put a label over it that makes you think you're in it when in fact you're not. The label they use, by the way, in the social structure globally that they use that you ain't a part of is uh, the international community. Anytime you read a newspaper or see on TV, the international community frowns on uh, the Palestinians throwing rocks. What is the international community? I read an article many years ago in Foreign Affairs, one of the journals where they say you got to make a distinction between international community and international community. When you see the phrase international community with a capital I and a capital C, that's the United States, England, France, the G7, and then they expand to the G20 because you got to, you know, you got Russia and y'all be beefing and then China, you can't keep out. But that little core that makes the decision, which at the core core is white until they can't stop people like China. But when you see international community, that phrase with lowercase I, lowercase C, that's everybody in the world. But there ain't no everybody in the world meeting. But seeing Chrome and them start going, you know, and is, this is a problem. This is a problem now. Because see, after World War II, when you set up international bodies to try to regulate the, the, the kind of reshuffling of European settler colonialism that has been taking place over the last several centuries. So you get the United Nations, 1945, you get the International Money Fund, you get the World Bank. In other words, you got to have these institutions to keep this process going. In that crack, you begin to see these non-white countries fighting, getting taking their independence, as King says, no, you didn't even concede anything. And then they start organizing each other. The Bandung Conference, 1955, the Afro-Asian Conference. And King writes about the Afro-Asian Conference and the fact that even though he is nonviolent, he said, when they begin to form with each other, you can't push them around anymore. So he's got all this stuff going. And see, what you see in Patrice Lumumba's case is a difficult moment because when Lumumba is finally elected to the, to the prime ministership, we're talking about 
uh, local elections, December 1959, uh, you see political violence. They put Lumumba in jail. They say he's, in, in, he's inciting a riot. Then they bring everybody to Brussels because remember Belgium, that criminal, Leopold, is the reason this thing is in a mess that it's in the first place. Mark Twain wrote about it in King Leopold's soliloquy. Uh, what's my man's name? George Washington Williams writes about it. Uh, the African Shepherd was a missionary in Central Africa. We talk more about, we, maybe we should do a whole thing on Congo. We should, by the way, shout out to my man, Sam Livingston, my dear friend and brother in African studies at Morehouse on Monday, they will be doing something to commemorate, uh, not to commemorate, to mark uh, with the Friends of the Congo, a very important international organization. Some of y'all Nubians probably in it. Uh, not only the killing of Patrice Lumumba, he was assassinated on the 17th of January, 1960, with the help of the Central Intelligence Agency. There's a book called Chief of Station Congo, which talks about all this. And then they hacked his body up, put him in, in this uh, uh, container of acid, you know, disseminated. By, only thing left from him were a couple of teeth. And so remember, we talked about that last summer when we talking about, you know, they're going to uh, allow, they said, the remains of Patrice Lumumba. Don't call it remains some teeth. And you're going to get them wrapped. Right to his children why because y'all i mean there's this graphic detail about all that um i won't get too deep into it but we, i really want to kind of wind to to a conclusion today we're going to begin to you know get this a little tighter the um patrice lumumba after he was killed he's taken out of power because patrice lumumba for the united states of africa too Patrice Lumumba, who was not without contradictions is very important one of the criticisms of course you see and even a conversation with his wife He's having on the on the verge of them taking power in Congo. His wife is like, okay, we know about you every ways. I love you. Every ways, y'all uh you get in power, and then you get rid of your wives, and you go find these white women. Ooh. That's what's gonna happen. I know it ain't gonna happen with you. I love you, but I mean you need to talk to your friends. In other words. And it's crazy you see the number of them who do that. Uh, what's my man who's in Senegal? Leopold Senghor, same thing. You know, sister you met in France, he's from Caribbean. They was married for years, their children together, and then he come to power, he come to white woman. Uh, Clarence Tom, oh, sorry. Um, then, you know, wait, oh, sorry. Uh, then you have uh you name Freddie Duck. Oh, sorry. <laughs> but the first wife is black. This is an African phenomenon, too. So not without contradictions, you understand. And you know, people say, well, you know, you shouldn't say anything because people love who they love. No, people who love people love who they socialize to love. This ain't got nothing to do with mm. biology. This ain't got nothing to do with affection. This got everything to do with socialization. Why do you aspire to that? Because you didn't aspire to it at the beginning. Or were you always with your whole heart hoping for it? And once you got in a position to do it, you know, now you've been drafted and you're in. Anyway, uh, point is, um, I don't mean the military draft. I mean the plantation draft known as professional athletics. And, and, you know, or maybe, you know, they meet you at the plane with the boosters and cheerleaders. And I've seen that happen many times at Ohio State. Um, not at Temple so much. John Cheney wasn't having that shit. But anyway, but at Ohio State, that was the <laughs> coin of the realm, baby. <laughs> anyway, I've seen that happen many times. But the point is, that's socialization. That's not love. Love is not, love without context. Now you're just talking. You know, that's abstract. It's like talking like saying uh, men or women are the movement. Now you're, okay, yeah. But anyway, the point is that Lumumba was assassinated. And of course, Congo goes through all these years today, till to this day of turmoil and struggle and trying to be people together. But one thing is consistent among many other things, but one thing is consistent in Democrat Republic Congo. Even after he was killed, everybody want to identify with him. Now, why do we compare on December 17th, uh, 1960, uh, the assassination of uh, Patrice Lumumba, 61 rather, and the birth of Martin Luther King on, I'm sorry, January 17th, 1961, the assassination of Patrice Lumumba and the birth of Martin Luther King, January 15th, 1929, Atlanta, Georgia. We combine them because after they are both assassinated and taken out, and if you don't think that both those things were for this virtually the same reason, you're not paying attention. In fact, Martin King in this book talks about assassinations. He talks about Kennedy's assassination in uh, Why We Can't Wait. 
And it's interesting because when he says Kennedy was killed, let me go to, let me see, pay, let me see if I can think, if I can find it quickly. It's in the last chapter, the days to come. He says Kennedy's assassinated. And he says, Negroes tragically know political assassinations well. In the life of Negro civil rights leaders, the whine of the bullet from ambush, the roar of the bomb have all too often broken the night's silence. They have replaced lynching as a political weapon. This is Martin Luther King. I have a dream. Now I'm going to go read while we can't wait. Page 144, the days to come. King goes on, says, they, let me repeat that last line. They have replaced lynching as a political weapon. This man himself going to be taken out by a bullet. And he's saying, shooting at black people is the new lynching. This is two generations before Sandra Bland y'all said hung herself in her cell come on now lynching this is generations before brianna taylor is killed in her bed these bullets are the new lynching king continues and he says more than a decade ago sudden death came to mr and mrs harry t moore naacp leaders in florida the reverend george lee of belzoni mississippi was shot to death on the steps of a rural courthouse the bombings multiplied 1963 was a year of assassinations Megan evers in jackson mississippi william moore in alabama six negro children in birmingham and who could doubt that these two were political assassinations he says the unforgivable default of our society has been its failure to apprehend the assassins. It is a harsh judgment, but undeniably true that the cause of the indifferent, that the cause of the indifference was the identity of the victims. You know what he's writing about this chapter? The assassination of John Kennedy, November 22nd, 1963. And he's saying, since y'all want to talk about Kennedy, let's talk. King goes on and says, nearly all were Negroes and so the plague spread until they claimed the most eminent American a warmly loved and respected president. Remember Martin, uh, remember Malcolm X saying the chickens came home and the roofs were damn. Here's Martin Luther King writing the same thing. He said this violence, y'all have been, except Malcolm said it was all over the world. He would have added Patrice Lumumba to that list. He would have added, all them other, you know what I'm saying? But then King, look, look at this now. King says, see, it went all around and then it claimed your friend. Watch this sentence right here. Remember, King don't report to the president. He report to God. King writes the words of Jesus. Quote, inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me. And quote, were more than a figurative expression. They were a literal prophecy. King reading that colored Bible. They ain't got a label on the front, but <laughs> now, now, now imagine that. They mad at Malcolm. Clearly you didn't read King. Said the same thing. And then put the Bible verse on your ass. In as much as you did it to Medgar, as you did it to Addie Mae and Cynthia, in as much as you did it to Virgil and Johnny, in as much as you did it to Denise, you did it to Kennedy. Don't play with me. Y'all mm. said, said I have a dream, and y'all bombed that church in Birmingham, and then John Coltrane cultural meaning making wrote a song to the sermon I gave that day in the 16th Street Baptist Church y'all keep mistaking us for just people living in the United States of America we are citizens of the world we came from Africa and the world exists in reality and we got something that we report to that's bigger than you can even imagine that's what Howard Thurman taught me so you messing around and on Monday they're going to talk about painting schools they're going to talk about holding hands and they're going to walk right by Martin Luther King on the way to talk about Martin Luther King. Now, he's assassinated 1968. Priest Lumumba has been assassinated seven years before. And then movement and memory come into play. Save me, Joe Lewis. Save me, Joe Lewis. In the middle of hopelessness, we don't call on that's why hands up don't shoot whatever Joe Lewis hands went up when he beat Max Schmeling ass they were up <laughs> yeah Muhammad Ali's hands weren't up when he forced Floyd Patterson to say my name y'all hated Muhammad Ali till he got sick now you love him why you love him because he can't punch you dead in your face but let's be clear, in our moments of deep crisis, we don't look to hope and inspiration 
for your system. So I'm going to go back and watch the first two episodes of Mothers of the Movement, but I wanted to get to the episodes where they fighting. Mamie Till fought till she took her last breath. Mamie Till's husband was her ride or die. You don't see Mobley. You see him in, the, you see him in, this, in this piece. Her mother come in the kitchen. You cooking for the whole damn Chicago NAACP? Tanya, you played that. Uh -uh. And in that subtle moment when you put that fire on, the one that the poet is saying Emmett Till picked up on, Tanya, when you when, when you took that subtle shift and said, well, and then you started, you took over the kitchen. Mm, this is the genius of master actors. They don't act with their mouth. They act with their eyes. They act with their body. It's a beautiful thing to watch ensembles of black actors or to watch a master black actor. I was forcing myself to watch Macbeth the other night. I don't give a damn. I got all the Macbeth books. We did Shakespeare, all that kind of stuff. You know, there's a good book called Shakespeare in Africa where it's this whole thing. How do you absorb? But watching Denzel Washington and Macbeth, the rest of them, you know, my Lord, uh, uh, Francis McDormand, all great actors. But Denzel, somehow Denzel never stopped being Denzel and took on Macbeth. <laughs> <laughs> That's an actor. People saw Denzel ain't acting. He just being Denzel. Okay, you try that with Shakespeare. Some of y'all actors, Tanya know exactly what I'm talking about because she does it. When you take on that old dead ass European stuff, y'all watch Paul. Y'all watch Paul Robeson and Othello. Be Paul Robeson. And if you ain't got nothing else to do, it's four o'clock in the morning. And you turn on Apple TV. Watch <laughs> Denzel Washington be Macbeth. <laughs> Damn. Wait, is that De that's Denzel? And quite frankly. I wish he hadn't got caught up in all that stuff, man, because my God. Howard Rollins in Ragtime. Mm. Mm. The Soldier Story. And remember, he got fired from the show they put him on on the TV version of the movie that was Heat of the Night. The Heat of the Night. I was like, how did I miss Howard Rollins? We should have said something about Howard Rollins. Some of y'all young people might not know where Howard Rollins is. Y'all go look him up. Mm -hmm. Last film he made before he made transition. He from Baltimore. It was a movie on Kwanzaa. That's a true story. Anyway, we're coming to the <laughs> conclusion how they remembered King almost immediately became a subject of bitter contention. Even his lieutenants. There's a great new book, and I mentioned this last year to y'all, and I want to mention it again. A book by his professor at Morehouse, Andrew Douglas, what a, one of uh, uh, Sam's colleagues at Morehouse, and Jared Loggins, who's one of their students at Morehouse, who's now at Amherst College. This book not, is barely 100 pages without footnotes. In fact, it's not 100 pages without footnotes. It's 94 pages. Actually, it's 93 pages without footnotes. Prophet of Discontent, Martin Luther King and the Critique of Racial Capitalism. This book opens on the clock. This book opens with on March 27th, 1968, a week before he was killed in Memphis, Martin Luther King Jr. joined Stanley Levison, Andrew Young, and several other confidants for an evening gathering in New York City apartment of the singer and civil rights activist, Belafonte, Harry Belafonte. Earlier that day, King had met with the poet of Mary Baraka in Newark. Again, what y'all talking about? None of your business. <laughs> a city <laughs> governor social structure. What y'all talking about? Governor structure. None of your business. Except y'all would probably keep pressing Martin Luther King, but that big dude over there grinning with his arm around telling me he's my brother. Save me, Joe Lewis. That's Muhammad Ali. King is nonviolent, but I don't think you really want to step up and put that microphone too close to Muhammad Ali's man. You might get that work. <laughs> anyway, in Newark, a city still reeling from the deadly riots of the previous summer. It was a city King feared that was poised to erupt all over again. King was killed. Over 100 cities went up in smoke. King trying to tell y'all, where do we go from here? Chaos or community? I'm telling you which way it's going. This is what's going to happen if y'all don't try it the other way. What I'm trying to tell you is you can do it without violence. What I'm telling you is you can have universal basic income. What I'm telling you is you can have housing for everyone and education. What I'm saying is the United States need to pull back from them big ass military budgets and it's war in Vietnam. Shout out to Vincent Harding who helped him write that speech. And the whole world can change, but y'all don't want to let go of your anti-human behavior. And what you don't understand is you're not in control. Behind the dim unknown is a force you can't even. And King said over and over again in these pages. And when you hear him talk, 
You read his books, you realize he's saying this over and over. He said, see, y'all keep it up and God going to take your, it's going to break the backbone of your power and put that power in the name of somebody who don't even know his name. What the hell was that? that now you're talking Howard Thurman, baby. I done gone past that Bible. You insist on putting a colored label over. That ain't even in. That's in. The, mm -mm, don't even try. King goes on and says he's worried about what's going to happen. At the time, King was working to organize the Poor People's Campaign. What was to be a multiracial march on an occupation of Washington, D.C., an occupation of Washington, D.C., a mass demonstration meant to press the American people into a serious confrontation with material poverty. And in New York that evening, King was in, quote, a surly mood, end quote. He confided in Belafonte and others that Newark and his meeting with the militant Baraka had gotten to him. The suffocating conditions there and an increasing willingness among the city's youth to embrace violent resistance tactics were once again testing his long haul strategy for non-violent change. I wholly embrace everything they feel, King said of the militant contingent in Newark, and he writes about it in a chapter on black power and where do we go from here, chaos or community, where he critiques black power, but he says, well, I don't have a problem with the pride. I don't have a problem with the solidarity. He puts a blueprint for black power in here, even as he's critiquing it. And he says, one thing we got to do is come together as a people and we must base that in our pride. Of who He said, we are from Africa. He said, we're in America now. We ain't going nowhere. But let me be very clear. We have to have solidarity. It's a whole concept. Actually, chapter five of this book, they write about this as a possible Pan-Africanism. I don't even think they had to go that far. Just read King himself. Goes on. He says, I wholly embrace everything they feel, King said of the militant contingent in Newark. I have more in common with these young people than with anybody else in this movement. I feel their rage. I feel their pain. I feel their frustration. It's the system that's the problem, and it's choking the breath of, out of our lives. Watch this. As Belafonte recalls of the conversation that evening, it was Andrew Young the future U.S. congressman and ambassador to the United Nations who unwittingly ratcheted up King's anger. Quote, I don't know, Martin, end quote, Young said, quote, it's not the entire system. It's only part of it. And I think we can fix that, end quote. King was having none of it. Quote, I don't need to hear from you, Andy. He clapped back. You're a capitalist and I'm not. Mm. The trouble is that we live in a failed system. Capitalism does not permit an even flow of economic resources. With this system, a small privileged few are rich beyond conscience and almost all others are doomed to be poor at some level. That's the way the system works. And since we know that the system will not change the rules, we are going to have to change the system, end quote. First footnote in the book. Now they spend these 95 pages. By the time they get to chapter five, they say after he is killed, you see then the King Center founded and the Institute of Black World, Vincent Harding, is put together, uh, asked by Coretta Scott King to put together something called the Institute of the Black World. If you want to read by the IBW, my man Derek White's book is good, The Challenge of Blackness, The Institute of the Black World and Political Activism in the 1970s. There's Vincent Harding there. Um, and it's very important you see him there. Bill Strickland, who's still alive, the University of Massachusetts Emeritus now is over here. But you can read and should read Vincent Harding for himself. This is a book called, well, it's a publication called Education in Black Struggle, Notes from the Colonized World. This is Institute of the Black World Pieces. Um, Walter Rodney is in here. The Jamaicans are in here. Robert Rumble. Um, but the first piece is Vincent Harding, the vocation of the black scholar and the struggles of the black community. Vincent Harding, who helped write that Why I Opposed the War in Vietnam speech. Vincent Harding, who's clear about King's political philosophy. Vincent Harding, who Coretta Scott King is a, asked him to come and be the director of the King Center. Vincent Harding, who then directs the Institute of Black World, which has room in the King Center. They almost immediately start, you see the tension, and this is chapter five, A Prophet of Discontent, between the whole King's notion and version and reality and the attempt to narrate King, moving the memory. Who is he to us now? What's I got to do with Lumumba? Two books I'm going to leave everybody with that I think would be good in terms of breadcrumbs to start with. One may be a little bit more difficult to get than the other, but at least y'all know about them, so you know. This is an interesting book, and I showed y'all this one before, In the Spirit of Martin, The Living Legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. In this book, it page after page, you see how King is narrated and how movement and memory. See, this is what I love about our people. Because the photographers, the great photographers, you know, maybe Till understood that, maybe Till Moses. When you take a picture of black people, it's hard to mess it up. You ain't got to say nothing. Let that text speak for itself. Look at that intergenerational. Where that little boy learned to be cool like that? <laughs> By them cats standing behind him. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Where did Claire Hunter learn how to move whole societies with her? Do you know about her family? Okay, 
And if she you ask her questions about her family, she's gonna share something with you. And if you keep pressing, she might say none of your business. Why? Because governance structures, in fact, this is one of my favorite pictures of Martin Luther King. They arrested him, right? How does Martin Luther King, even while getting arrested, look so damn cool? <laughs> my man's hat is it he got even even had a coat coming off his hand on the jump. I'm like, you're ever say it too too. But my point is that after he's killed, they start narrating him. They start narrating him, right? You start seeing the narration. Uh, and so, and of course, the famous, you know, he is in a black home. Bobby Kennedy, Robert Kennedy, Martin Luther King, Abraham Martin and John, Schwerner Goodman and Cheney. I was kind of thinking, this is an art piece, but it's styled in the Africana cultural meaning making style. Meaning what? We put pictures in photo, in mirrors, right? Of the ancestors. I won't go on in that. There's one, they did the same thing with Lumumba. This is the most recent of several books. The first major, in, well, not the first major, the other, what's my man, uh, B B Juice P did one. But anyway, this is one called Lumumba in the Arts. They do the same thing. After you kill him, you beatify him, right? Patrice Lumumba here is with Mandela and Barack Obama. That's a mistake. Anyway, I mean, I love how we we, we were wanting to stick Barack Obama on these shirts. I'm like, Barack Obama was in charge of the same military King said, gotta go. Shishikede, who ended up being uh, his his kid is the, now the uh, president of Congo. They're going to put him next to Lumumba too. This book here is uh, 450 pages, just of, uh, just of iconography, just of photographs and essays about how they deal with Lumumba. Why? Because the point is that societies will try to narrate people we hold up in order to try to get us to behave differently now. So the king they're going to try to sell on Monday is the one they've been selling since they tried to be killed, to kill him. But in the governance structure, we have to combat the we have to combat the impulse to shrink to those to conform to those standards. Now, here's why, and this is the last thing I'll say. That's a difficult task because Patrice Lumumba, which wasn't his birth name, by the way, we might have to do a whole thing on Patrice. Lumumba. Oh my goodness! Yeah. Yeah, that's a whole nother thing. I said, oh, that's and that that's real sensitive. We had to talk about that, which will make the point, but I'm not going to stop here on it. Because his, his birth name translates into that who will not live long or something like that's that. That's exactly crazy. right. That is exactly. And his mama lived until like the year 2000. Right. And then check this out. That's why I won't stop on it. But one of the names he adopts translates to white. Because part of the notion of being an evoe and I want everybody to think about that who's engaged in this kind of petty bourgeois exercise that, that, that Carter Woodson is excoriating in the miseducation of the Negro, not without problems, but understand this, that part of the aspiration, when you say you're a leader, but you mimicking the thing that's oppressing our people, you're not a leader. You might be an evil way. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But Patrice Lumumba is a complicated figure. After he is not here physically, when you make him an ancestor, a venerated ancestor, you can scrub all that other stuff out. Martin King, the fight after he's assassinated is over his meaning and it continues to this day. And this is why I said the last thing I was going to say is that, that that work is difficult because we have to balance it in terms of movement and memory. How did or do African people remember these experiences with a very real commitment to being in community with our ancestors, with ourselves and with the future generations in ways that allow us all entry. Because if we beatify them beyond human capacity to be, then he's on his way to Jesus Christ. And that's important. I always tell my students all the time. I used to tell them, I said, you know, by the time your grandchildren come around, Martin Luther King will have waved his hands and the hoses will lose their water and the dogs will lie down. Martin Luther King gonna walk on water like my man um, in Senegal, uh, Sheikh Amadou Bamba. Profit in the city. I'm looking at the exhibition catalog over there. You'll have him doing all kinds of stuff. And then you'll say, well, I can't do that. So I can't aspire to that. But what King is making in that point in, in, in chapter seven of uh, why we can't wait. When that brother smelling that gas, realizes he's about to go calls out for Joe Lewis. What he's saying is in the most hopeless moments, we call on the on the figures and on the concept that we can resist and we can somehow survive. But King Lumumba just like those six children in Birmingham. And you see how he said six there? Me and he put Johnny Robinson 
and Virgil Ware with Cynthia Wesley with in them, with, with, with Addie Mae Collins in them, with Carol Ann Robeson with them, with Denise McNair in them. He counted all six. But what have we allowed this social structure to do? Four little angels who gave their lives. They didn't give their lives. King says of an assassination just like they blew Kennedy's head off. Except when you did it to the least of these, you did it to yourself. So let's just sit with Martin Luther King on Monday while we watch the propaganda or not. Or better yet, order this because we're going to read it together. Where do we go from here? Chaos the community. <laughs> and then you can just turn off all that other stuff where they make you paint your own community center after you paid your taxes and call it service because that's what Dr. King would have wanted you to do. <laughs> And then at 8 p.m. Eastern, we're going to join you in office hours to 8 p.m. Eastern. Yes. Yes. Finish uh, Carter G. Woodson's Miseducation of the Negro. So we and got this week and next week. We got yeah. we got a third of them this week and a third of them next week. That's right. So if y'all want to thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hunter. Well, Professor Hunter. Here we go. Y'all see the table of contents. All right. We did one through six. We got a little cleaning up to do on the educated Negro leads the masses. Chapter six, which we talked about last week a little bit, we're going to talk some more, is naturally linked to chapter seven, dissension and weakness. Look at that. And mm. we're going to do chapter six. Uh, so that's chapter, actually, the failure to earn to make a living, right? We're going to do chapter seven, dissension and weakness. Chapter eight, professional education discouraged. Chapter nine, political education neglected. Chapter 10, the loss of vision. Chapter 11, the need for service rather than leadership. Oop. Mm. And chapter 12 hirelings in the hmm. place of public servants oh when he gets into politics you'll think he's talking about 2022 shout out to tim scott my man mass scott of south carolina i think woodson's trying to get your attention bro um, anyway. well, he's not paying attention so it doesn't matter no, he, he's not paying attention that's why i gotta put something else on him we, we're going to decolonize our minds on monday and tomorrow we're going to decolonize our tongues uh, as Dr. Senyata in Nubia is going to take us through a battle of the Caribbean islands. So she's going to, oh! uh, yeah, so I think it's Trinidad versus Jamaica or something tomorrow. So wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm not ready. Yes. Y'all about that. It's about to be a versus. Yeah. She's going to do a versus uh, taking us through how Africans got dropped off different places and what we brought to these different places. And then how, I mean, it's, it's, it's about to go down. I'm, the man, I'm so enjoying the man on your shirt. The man on your shirt said it best. From the point of a finger is how you became a Jamaican and not a New Yorker. From a point of the finger is how you ended up in Brazil and not New Orleans. From the point of a finger is why you end up in Trinidad and not Jersey or Georgia or South Carolina. Why the hell are y'all fighting when somebody's point of the finger has started to beef? John Clark was a genius, a master teacher. Oh, but but I ain't, I'm here for a little bit. That's almost as bad as the Joliff Wars, but I ain't gonna say nothing because I know it's some Negroes in, uh, in Nubia right now who fight those Joliff Wars. Man, we up about 850. Look, this is early. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. We here, we here. And it'll be thousands on, on Monday. And uh, that's how we gonna celebrate King. Uh, and I thank you so much because uh, that Joe Lewis, whoo, that, that, sat, that, that hit me. Professor Hunter. That hit me. Me too. And it hit and it hit and it hit Dr. King. Yeah. Mm. Save, save me, Joe Lewis. Save me, Joe Lewis. We still saying that. Mm. I love you. I love uh, you. Nubians, we'll see you. We'll catch you in the Nubian streets. Uh, we'll see y'all, most of y'all on Monday and tomorrow Monday. with um, Maroon's medicine chest. Yes. And we'll keep it going uh, as we march to 100. Uh, Dr. Carr, thank you. Thank you. Have a, Thank a you wonderful rest of your day. Love you too.